Welcome back. You're still watching our live coverage of the U.S. election from our studios here in Lagos. And of course, our gentlemen are still here with us in the studio. Mr. Muyua Shobo is here. Mr. Chukwemeka Eze is here. Thank you so much for staying with us on the program. My pleasure. Now, we've talked about some of the legacies of President Barack Obama, which is, of course, improving the U.S. economy. Now, when you talk about the U.S. economy, what exactly do you mean by saying that he improved the U.S. economy? Uh, for instance, if you look at the... But let's look at it from the point of taxation at first. You know, when Bush first was there, they had this idea about trickle-down economy. That's what um, Donald Trump is trying to do now, reduce taxes on the, on the, on the higher income. So to free money, for investment, it never happened that way. We tumbled into a recession. So, bringing the come and and I experienced that. I was there. I saw it about the housing crisis. That was major. But pulling us from there, it's it's to me the greatest achievement of Obama. Because as soon as that happens, employment now um, uh, blossomed and. Um, People, more people are making more money, and that is helping their families. So that, to me, is, is really key. And he took steps, definite steps, including regulatory steps, which Trump is threatening to take away. He's talking about regulations. And then alternative energy stuff. The dependency of the United States on foreign oil actually reduced during his time because they pour money and invested in alternative energy the free up some um, reserves of the United States, and that again helped the economy. I knew when, and the the the, the prices of fuel, which are called gas over there, was skyrocketing and it was killing the economy. But they put in policy in place that focused on that alternative energy, and that went down a little bit. That is a big help in the economy as well. So, well, earlier in the day when, you know, we're tracking uh, our business news, mm -hmm. uh, well, we noticed that when the global economic indexes were being uh, measured according to the results coming out of the stock markets across the world, well, it appeared as if any time the opinion polls or the polls in any way started favoring uh, Donald Trump, the markets started going down. Yeah. Does that portend what will be the outcome or the consequence if the result finally goes, if the result finally goes Mr. Trump's way? Uh, maybe not necessarily, and I'll let um, mm, my let colleague me say something. Um, um, uh, the bearish or bullish nature of the stock exchange is largely dependent on perception. So in trading at the stock exchange, a, a, a lot of uh, mileage is given to how the traders perceive a governmental action, a government policy, the outcome of the election. So if they see that the coming government will be unstable, or the character is somebody who can be impulsive and once they discover that things will be unstable, definitely the trading will come down. But if they discover that the person is predictable, the, the status quo will be maintained, definitely trading will stabilize. So as for Trump, they believe, the traders believe that, uh, no, this one, is going to cause a lot of havoc to the system. And if it is so, then we begin to wind down before it comes in. So that process makes the prices to come down. For instance, even taking from uh, a mundane aspect nearer to us, if you discover that uh, more people will be importing a certain product and that their goods will be landing next tomorrow. You will want to quickly sell your own, even at a lower rate, before they bring their own to the market. You've not seen the goods, so. <laughs> it's just the news, and you consider it real. You begin to take action. So when it comes to trading, so although it's a more sophisticated concept, 
the perception plays a very large role. Look at the case of Nigeria. When the uh, some of these, uh, like S&P, Standard and Poor, and uh, uh, the other one, J JP Morgan, when they, are, they were sounding warnings that Nigeria doesn't do this, we will do this. So we were taking it for granted. But any serious foreign investor who wants to come to Nigeria will look at the ease of doing business, the perception index. And when they look at it, they, these are the people they will seek for their, their advice. And if these people say that, just as we were considering the election, you, you, you say these are battleground states, these are states that are blue, these are states that are red. When it comes to the economy, and you bring it to that kind of analysis, basically it begins to affect the trading pattern. So I mean in answering your question directly, Trump is seen as somebody that will destabilize the status quo. So until he comes to restore the system to equilibrium, the implication is that the trading pattern will come down. And you have to you, you have to look at their programs, economic programs. Right now, the popularity of Obama is actually based on the job growth that you know occurred when he's um, his um, his president. And then the deficit spending. And economists actually look at both programs, uh, Hillary's and um, and Donald Trump's, and they come out and say this one is going to cause some real great deficit in the economy. And so and like like you said, those are the advisors that these investors listen to. So when they look at both programs and the fact that you are going to go back to that trickle down economy that causes the recession in the first place, well, yeah, people will be a little bit careful. And so uh, my friend is right when he's talking about maintaining the status quo. Hillary Clinton is going to maintain that in the sense that, uh, you know, she didn't say she's not going to increase taxes, but it's going to be on the top uh, earnest. And most of these billionaires actually agree with that. You know, because they wanted to pay their 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 fair share. You know, Warren Buffett was the, was the one who came and said, "Well, my tax rate is actually lower than that of my secretary." And so, when Donald Trump said, "We're going to change it," and they're looking at him as somebody who has no experience in that area, who has not run anything before, of course, it will send jitters through the through the through the stuff, and that's what we are saying. I think economically, Donald Trump, if he becomes the president, is going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's, mm, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. let's take you back to the issue of foreign relations. You know, I think some of, some of what President Barack Obama has been able to achieve is normalizing relations with Cuba, you know, after 50 years of hostilities. Fantastic. But one area where he wasn't able to do much was in the issue of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And it's not the only president. <laughs> so many other U.S. presidents Nobody's have tried and that. they have not actually been able to achieve any success. So what can the incoming U.S. government, what, what, is there anything new that it can bring to the table concerning this conflict between Israel and Palestine? Uh, it seems to me that they will do a revision, but nothing will come out of it. The conflict between Palestine and Israel should be taken from a historical concept or context. And you cannot get better than what we got under the Camp David Accord between Awan Sadat and Menachem Begin. That was in the time of Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. So, and how did it come about? After that experiment, that made Egypt to reconcile or to have peace, so to say, with Israel. Israel returned Sinai, which it took from Egypt during the 1967 war, six-day war. So it returned it in peace and not in war. So I'm giving you this background to, for you to know where I will get to, and that will answer your question. So, in those contexts, remember, in 1956, during the Suez Canal War, that Israel, France, and Britain attacked uh, Egypt. 
because of the nationalization of the Suez Canal. Uh, the United States was able to call Israel to order, and Israel withdrew. Uh, uh, Russia was funding uh, Syria and many other Arab countries. I recall before Glasnost and Perestroika in 1990, this Cold War, America used Israel as a stabilizer in the Middle East. Why, to some extent, Russia was...